By now, we all know of Nintendo's emergence as the dominant force after the video game crash in the mid-80s. But another challenger would quickly appear with the introduction of the Sega Master System in 1985. After being thoroughly pummeled in sales by the NES, Sega would revise its marketing approach and create a mascot that would be the anti-Mario. Said character was meant to be everything Mario wasn't. Cool, edgy, hip, and appealing. Thus, Sonic the Hedgehog was born. The massive success of his debut appearance on the Genesis allowed Sega to take the fight directly to Nintendo, and the momentum ramped up even further with the sequel, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. In 1993, work began on the third installment of the series, not counting the Game Gear games, two of which I already covered on this channel. Featuring a new backdrop known as Angel Island, Sonic 3 was supposed to be the biggest, baddest platformer yet, one that would put the first two games to shame. Unfortunately, Sega's vision for the game was far too large for them to complete it in time for release, so they had to cut a substantial amount of planned content, including three zones and a playable character. So Sonic 3 was released with only six zones, albeit much larger zones than, it, than in the first two games, and only Sonic and Tails as playable characters. Unlike its predecessors, though, it had a save feature, allowing for up to six save files to be stored on the cartridge. However, artifacts of the cut content appeared in the level select cheat menu, as the Mushroom Hill Flying Battery and Sendopolis zones appeared there, despite not being in the actual game. However, after Sonic 3's release, Sega started to work on a new game that would reveal their original vision for the game, not just that, but go above and beyond it. However, the Genesis's technical limitations wouldn't allow such an epic to fit on one cartridge. So, they did the next best thing, split it into two cards. The first one would be Sonic 3, and the second one would be dubbed Sonic and Knuckles. This effectively marked the birth of episodic content, long before it became referred to as such. In order to let us play the epic masterpiece they intended to do from the start, though, they used a peculiar way of doing things. Make the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge so that another cartridge could stack onto it. This stratagem was used for unauthorized NES and SNES games such as Little Red Hood and Super Noah's Ark 3D. But that was for the purpose of using authorized games to bypass lockout chips implemented in the consoles. Here, though, the purpose was different. Merge two games into one. It's that simple. Oh, of course you can play Sonic and Knuckles on its own. It features eight zones, completely different from the six in Sonic 3, but including the three that were ultimately axed from Sonic 3. However, you can only play as Sonic or Knuckles, not as Tails. And there's no save feature. Both games on their own aren't that remarkable, but it's when you plop Sonic 3 on top of Sonic and Knuckles that the magic happens. The resulting game has the rather awkward title of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, and features all 14 zones from the two games put together. The game starts you off in the Sonic 3 zones, then you move on to the Sonic and Knuckles ones when you're done with them. It also features Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles as playable characters which allows you to play as Tails in the Sonic and Knuckles zones, but also play as Knuckles in the Sonic 3 zones, some of which take you to whole different areas that couldn't be accessed with Sonic or Tails, and even a brand new boss in Act 2 of Marble Garden Zone. In addition, you get to play with 8 save slots in this version of the game, and these are completely separate from the vanilla Sonic 3 ones. But perhaps the enhancement players like the most is the introduction of the Super Emeralds. Both games have separate sets of special stages which grant you Chaos Emeralds when beaten. Get all seven Emeralds to become either Super Sonic or Super Knuckles. Tails gets nothing, because no one cares about him. But how would they handle that in such a behemoth of a game? Enter the Super Emeralds. Once you've gathered all seven Chaos Emeralds and encounter a giant ring in the Sonic and Knuckles zones, you're given a chance to upgrade one of your, of your Chaos Emeralds into a Super Emerald in the Sonic and Knuckles special stages. Should you succeed in getting all seven Super Emeralds, Sonic and Knuckles will unlock their high performs, which have never been since since, 
and Tails finally gets a super form to call his own. It's arguably the best transformation in the game, too, for that matter, with those flickies that attack nearby enemies automatically. It's really handy for bosses as well. Now you may be wondering, what happens if I plug in a game that's not Sonic 3 onto the cartridge? Good thing you asked. If you plug in Sonic 2, the end result is Knuckles in Sonic 2, which is exactly what it sounds like. You get to play as Knuckles throughout Sonic 2. Should you add the original Sonic the Hedgehog, unlike what you may expect, the same thing will not happen. Because of palette issues, they were unable to allow you to play as Knuckles in the original Sonic the Hedgehog game. Though, ever since then, ROM hacks have been made to allow you to do so. But that's the only way to play as Knuckles in the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Instead, you unlock a minigame that puts you through a never-ending gauntlet of Sonic 3-style special stages. 128 million of them, in fact. And should you connect anything else to Sonic and Knuckles, you get to play one of these 128 million stages, depending on which game you insert it. So as you can see, Sega really pulled out all the stops to make this game into one of the greatest 2D platformers to this very day. Which is why today, I'm going to revisit for you guys. Buckle up!